exploitation time. It's important, for example, for planning, for construction, wells construction, to select a proper uh, drill spacing between the wells. And actually, we are applying this complex at the uh, one of the mines, starting from pilot implementation and then go to the commercial stage. And that's the issue maybe because I know many companies do their own uh, tools for this. And, uh, but it's very important for in situ leach mining method because it's easy to do for open pit or for conventional mining methods where we see we can, we can operate, but if you do it underground with no contact to the ore, uh, this modeling becomes very important. And so, uh, maybe another point about it's also there were some discussions about natural uranium restoration and uh, of the aquifer after uh, mines after in situ leach mine. It occurs uh, due to a residual solution dilution and reaction with uh, hosting environment. And this is the case of environmental monitoring after pilot test at one of the deposits in Kazakhstan. And four main parameters were monitored. pH, sulfate ion, nitrate ion, and uranium. And in situ leach exposed area decreased in 50% during four years after completion of the uh, production, after production was stop, stopped. And complete restoration occurred within 12 years. In comparison to alkaline leaching, it's important to understand that natural attenuation occurred uh, when proper, uh, under proper monitoring of the process and comparison to the alkaline leaching, radium is stable in this situ leach and it's cons in consolidated and not uh, goes to the leaching solution. That's why there is no uh, need to uh, restore facilities and uh, aquifers from radium after the uh, mining is completed. And so, so some conclusion remarks. First, that starting from 2023, global uranium demand may exceed supply, and primary uranium production must increase by one and a half times by 2035. That global resource base is sufficient to assure long-term production, but its great share belongs to high-cost categories. That uranium companies may face economic and technical challenges in new mining project development. Then I will skip the, the next bullet, but Kazakhstan has increased uranium production more than six times during the last decade and keep the world leadership. 17 from 19 low cost operating mines with production cost below current spot price are in Kazakhstan. It can maintain uranium capacities at a level, at existing level until 2020, 40. However, planned uranium production may be 20% below capacities due to unfavorable market prices. And after 2020, it may face uranium production gradual decrease due to known resources mining depletion and all mine closure, limited resources potential for new in situ leach mines development, and favorable legislation might facilitate investments in uranium exploration in Kazakhstan and result to a new uh, uranium resources and deposit discovery. Sorry for some, but I have uh, granted some minutes from Kazakhstan guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for a very informative talk. Uh, fortunately, we don't have time for questions. Uh, and um, I think it's um, important to mention when um, Robert asked me to come and do a presentation here, um, I really couldn't resist. And there are two main reasons why I couldn't resist. One is because Uranium One is really a success story in Uranium. And uh, second point uh, is Uranium One has um, its major assets in Kazakhstan, which actually makes us the second largest uh, producer in Kazakhstan today. Um, A uh, cautionary statement, well, sorry, I have to stop here for a second as per advice of my legal counsel. Uh, what you will be presented with today is just a summary. If you would like to have more information on our operations, um, please uh, refer to public disclosure.
uh, contents. Um, well, I will focus this presentation on two main areas. I uh, will give you highlights of Iranian operations uh, globally, and uh, more importantly, we'll zoom in into performance of our tier one assets in Kazakhstan. Um, and I will touch base on um, prospects of uranium industry because the logo of this uh, technical uh, panel is uh, what the future holds for uranium in Kazakhstan. But as an opening remark, uh, I would like to uh, really relate to what Alexander has raised around concerns in the industry. And uh, it's been a while since uranium mining has been in a depressed uh, environment. Uh, and I think there are many reasons why it has been in depressed uranium, but Alexander Dorsov has mentioned a couple of them, which to which we uh, absolutely agree. We've seen uh, incredible uh, and diversified operations, six mines in Kazakhstan, one mine in uh, USA, as well as we have a developing project in Tanzania. Uh, uranium One is a low-cost producer thanks to its tier one assets in Kazakhstan, and uh, it hasn't been just a uh, a given fact uh, to leave to achieve low costs, uh, the teams at the mindset have been working uh, thoroughly for innovation, efficiency, and safe operations to achieve that result. Uh, the company also has strong financial and balance sheet. And in fact, if you look at our assets today, we have about two billion in uh, assets in USD dollars, around 400 million in 2000 and re uh, 400 million in revenue based on 2016 numbers. But when it comes to resources. I think Uranium One stands is a very uh, prominent player on the market with the long-term plans, and our total m and resource base today is uh, about 230 million pounds of measured and indicated e resources, with about uh, 200 plus million in the third category. Um, when it comes to employees, we have about 2,400 employees across the globe, and uh, around 2,300 of those employees actually at the mine site. Uh, and more importantly, Uranium One mining. Uh, assets um, have a world-class performance and safety and that was achieved through innovations and best practices at each mine site that we have including Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan primarily and one part of it is to mine the uranium the second part of it is to sell the uranium and uh, we have been supplying nuclear power plants across the globe uh, and have a long-term and mid-term uh, portfolio of clients uh, which we serve uh, on a regular basis and uh, on the regional presence, we do operate our operations um, in, through many offices. We have office in Canada, Europe, uh, Kazakhstan, Africa, and US, which helps to uh, keep our, our global asset portfolio uh, intact. Uh, this slide really to provide you with a high level overview of our current uh, mining uranium assets portfolio. And you can see that we, we, we own uh, uh, JV stakes in, uh, in five JV stakes in Kazakhstan. We have South Inkai, Dala, Agbastao, Karatao, the Rechnai mine, and Karasan mine as part of our portfolio. In the US, we have Willow Creek mine, which is in a low production mode. And uh, more importantly, we do have a uh, few other major projects in our portfolio which will assist us in uh, depleting retiring capacities when the time comes because uh, Mkuju River project is one of the projects that uh, we acquired back in 2011 and keep in our portfolio. We do not in a position to develop it in the current environment price, but this is something that will help us to fulfill retiring capacities as time comes by. And we do have uh, exploration and development por portfolio in US as well to, to ramp up and uh, fulfill our plans there. Uh, I think it's important to mention that um, our tier one assets are in Kazakhstan and um, we will continue placing greater emphasis on expecting those mines to operate. In terms of total production, uh, we produced 13 million pounds and those came in through Kazakhstan mines in 2017. One of the items uh, which people uh, typically uh, look at is your production profile. So if this slide really is to provide you uh, with overall understanding of how Uranium One's production profile looks like. And um, nobody, uh, or few people are actually aware that back in 2008, Uranium One was a junior mining company with just two million pounds in, in production. Today we have 13 million pounds and over time we experienced about five times degrees increase in production, which was again uh, due to strategic move to Kazakhstan, which helped us to increase our production and meet our targets. But as spot price was going down, 
we, use, we, we needed to look uh, and revise our plans for tier two assets in, in Australia and US and, and really ramp those down to meet uh, today's um, challenging environment. And in terms of uh, our um, assets in uh, Kazakhstan, I think it's important to mention that we've acquired them throughout the series of acquisitions starting from 2008 uh, up until 2013, and that really drove the growth in our production. And uh, since 2015, we became fourth largest uh, uranium producer um, in the world. Uh, if you if you look at Kazakhstan today and wonder uh, who are the players in Kazakhstan, I think some of the questions in the audience that we heard today were, um, what, are, what, what are the resources by companies? What are the production numbers by companies? I think this slide clearly, clearly illustrates that today Uranium One is the second largest uh, producer in Kazakhstan, and actually it's uh, one of the first uh, among foreign uranium producers uh, in Kazakhstan. And uh, this is just uh, by comparative statistics of resources and production as of now. It's a bit of a mixed bag if you look at the slide. Uh, production is in, uh, measured and indicated, sorry, in u 3 weight pounds, but attributable uh, resources is in C1 and C2 categories. This is our internal uh, estimates. In fact, um, thanks to all these points of, uh, for uh, being uh, uh, a key person on uh, monitoring this in terms of resources and production for us. Um, this slide is really to illustrate production and capacity in Kazakhstan because we have uh, six mines in Kazakhstan uh, which are operating today and as you saw earlier, uh, there are about uh, 19 mines in Kazakhstan. So the portfolio we have is is fairly a large portfolio of all the assets operating today in Kazakhstan. And this is to show how those assets have been developing over the next, over the last 10 years. And um, I would need to mention that most of the mines are relatively new mines that we have in our portfolio. With um, four out of six mines uh, currently having uh, operating at the uh, permitted capacity, only two mines have some residual capacity left, Khorasan and Harrison. And um, it's also um, kind of gives you the chart on the right, gives you an understanding which mines were first in production line, which mines came online later. But over the past five years, we have relatively stable production from, from Kazakhstan of around 13 million pounds on attributable basis. This slide really is um, about resources and great developments of our mines in Kazakhstan. I mean, this is technical panel and um, uh, some of the items typically uh, technical people watch for is how the resource was developed, what are the grades uh, uh, where uh, for the exploration and uh, resource estimation. And we have, again, a very good uh, experience in Kazakhstan and the resources have actually tripled over uh, uh, eight years period. And again, uh, the early years from 2008 to 2010 were primarily due to acquisition and some resource improvement, but the biggest jump we, you can see on this chart that happened from 2012 to 2013 was uh, primarily due to 3D modeling in resource estimations, which is more sophisticated and uh, gave us uh, a great increase in resources for both parties. Uh, and this is a summary for all the six GVs. And uh, that increase didn't came with some decrease in uh, grades. Grades remained consistently stable at uh, 0 0.06, 0 0.08% of u 3 wage. Which is, which is phenomenal, and again, it just shows why Kazakhstan today is uh, one of the major areas to mine uranium from. Um, going forward, um, I think it's also important to look at largest deposits worldwide and do some comparison and, and place where uranium mine, mines are today. And this really shows that uh, one of the largest deposits that uh, are out there today in the world are um, in our portfolio. Two mines, Karatau and Bastau, which are mining Budyonovska deposit, really are, is the second largest uh, deposit in the world. We also managed, um, when we looked at this carefully, to realize that Karasan is, a, is another one which is in our, in our portfolio and is eighth largest deposit in the world. So if you look at, uh, at this picture uh, overall and try to understand where the biggest mines and deposits today are in terms of top 10 operating mines, you can see that three of the mines that we have in our portfolio are among the top 10. 
Uh, and I think in terms of uh, measured and indicated resources, it's, it's also quite uh, significant for us to say that uh, we have three mines among the top 10 because those three mines represent about 60% of our total measured and indicated resources in, in our portfolio of Kazakhstan mines, which is a very, very significant number for us. Uh, this slide really is to quickly give you an understanding of mineralization depth, uh, and um, it's important to, to really realize that Kazakhstan mines uh, are one of the deepest mines in the world, and what we have in the portfolio, as you can see, three out of uh, six mines actually um, uh, have mineralization depth 600 to 700 meters in the earth. Uh, if you compare that with Australian and US mines, which are relatively shallow, the first question is, how can you mine that deep and still be one uh, as a low cost producer? Well, uh, you have to realize that the drilling costs are different in different parts of the world and based on what we've seen in US uh, for our operations and what we've seen in Kazakhstan, there is about 2.5 times difference. So that makes uh, possible to mine at such a uh, depth in Kazakhstan and be cost competitive. And um, in terms of costs, I think um, we've seen this slide from previous presenter, but this is about uh, to conclude on the same, uh, that uh, uh, five out of uh, six mines that we have in our portfolio are today in top 10 lowest uh, cost mines in the world. And um, of the past four years, uranium one uh, assets in Kazakhstan has actually improved operating cash costs by five to six dollars a pound. When we reported our cash costs back in 2013, the number was close to $14, $15 a pound. So when you, when you reduce your cost by 4 to uh, $6 a pound, it, it really was a major success for, for mining uh, team back there. And um, today we keep our operations intact just because of those additional incentives and additional uh, cost um, improvements that were realized. But there were also other factors that helped to keep Kazakhstan mines, uh, including our portfolio, intact. That was devaluation of Kazakhstan and USD dollars, which is well known. But um, despite outstanding performance of our mines in Kazakhstan, I think it's important to realize that today's spot price is not sustainable for anybody because if you look at the total cost of a life of mine, there are so many other costs that need to be ac uh, accounted for and not always uh, well understood when it comes to total uh, cost of production and um, uh, unfortunately we don't expect spot price to increase in the uh, short term but we do have a strong view that spot price based on utilities requirements will uh, become much much uh, hopefully higher uh, after 2020-2023. Um, on the next slide, I think it's important to conclude also on health and safety. And um, health and safety has been uh, quite a success for our operations in Kazakhstan. And this slide is really to illustrate how health and safety performance, uh, total recordable incident rate, has improved over a 10-year period. And uh, it's phenomenal uh, because in 2016, we reported uh, total recordable incident rate at around uh, 0 0.03, which is really uh, one incident for uh, 2,400 uh, employees. And um, ISL proves uh, with the good statistics on health and safety that it is safe, reliable, and remains to be uh, low cost uh, operations worldwide. And um, uh, to put this in perspective, uh, I think if you look at the mining sector in general, you will see much higher total recordable incident rates. I think they are ranging at uh, 2.2, 2.5 based on MSHO US uh, Mining Association statistics, but ISL mines are typically having much lower, much lower total recordable incident rates uh, worldwide if you look at any other mines. Um, so uh, on closing remarks, I think it's uh, uh, quite a um, good story for everyone to present here uh, with all the six mines we have in GV and development projects elsewhere. And um, you just seen how successful the story was for us to be in Kazakhstan. And um, yes, we have a strong portfolio of six operating mines in Kazakhstan. Yes, we're the world largest and uh, fourth most um, largest producer in the world today. But um, when it comes to uh, what to expect from the future, 
I think uh, I would like to conclude that at Uranium One we will continue placing greater emphasis on our Uranium One Tier One assets in Kazakhstan, and we'll watch for price improvement uh, going forward and get our uh, productions uh, ready in U.S. and Tanzania and, and elsewhere for Ampop when we have a better uh, price of uranium in the market. Uh, with that in mind, I would like to thank you for your attention and open the floor for some questions. Thank you. So you mentioned fourteen dollars per pound uh, production costs, cash costs. Well, what are your well-filled flushing costs, and what are your exploratory uh, capex costs, and what are your confirmation drilling costs above and beyond on a per pound basis? So if you look at our uh, sorry, uh, the question is about our capex uh, cost per pound. Just to repeat the question, so audience can hear it. Uh, when we looked at our capex uh, expenditure profile over the last five uh, to ten years, what is important to realize that. It has been changing. Over the past few years, we experienced uh, capex of around five to six dollars a pound. Any well-filled flushing costs? I don't have that specific number in mind, uh, but uh, why don't you give us your contact and we can get back to you with that number? Can we just follow up real quick? What about a listing? You know, because Adam Prom government entity is going to list via JP Morgan. Uh, you guys were listed in the mid 2000s. You think about coming back to the market? Uh, thanks for the question about our IPO plans. Uh, it's it's um, uh, true. We've been listed as a general mining company since 2002, and we delisted ourselves in 2015 because of strategic transaction. Uranium One became part of our southern group of companies and uh, is its international mining division. Uh, and we are privately owned today. We still maintain our public disclosure and uh, post our financial statements due to our bonds that are listed in stock exchange. But in terms of our plans on IPO going forward, um, we, we do have uh, that on our list to watch for, but there are no concrete plans at this stage. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question about the currency. Uh, how much inflation is there in That's, that's a good, that's a one billion dollar question, I would say. Uh, it, it has been, it has been uh, a roller coaster when it comes to USD dollar and uh, Tenge uh, currency fluctuations. In fact, back in 2014, uh, Kazakhstan Tenge devaluated uh, two times compared to USD dollar. And it remains at that level with some uh, upward trending seen recently over the past uh, six to eight months. So when we look at our mines, uh, which project, uh, which forecasted uh, price we take, we take those that are published by, by any major banks. We don't have any other insight into this. This is really hard to, to put your finger on and say, yes, it's going to move uh, downwards. It's going to move upwards with this, this magnitude. Uh, we don't know. Thanks, it's a great question, an expected one <laughs> um, in the current environment. So any announcement that Kazakhstan promised them, it's, those are the, their announcements. And uh, just as I fleshed out at the beginning of the presentation, we are a GB partner on six mines, but Kazakhstan Prom has much more mines than just those uh, that we have uh, done with the joint partnership. Uh, in terms of our production plans for uh, years to come, we do um, operate on a budget basis. We do uh, complete our budget process by end of Q1. So those are, those plans are still being fleshed out. Okay, if there's uh, no more questions, uh, thank you for a very informative uh, speech.
So you've heard the previous speakers talking about uh, unsustainable uranium price. So the operators have to look at ways to you know, improve their uh, process, their activities. And that's what the next two uh, talks will cover. We'll see how operators uh, looked inside and try to optimize many of their uh, processes. So I want to invite uh, Noel Voiken. Noel is Director, Technology Group with Chemico, and his talk is about uranium ISR at Inca. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll share a bit of an overview of the Inkai Uranium Project. First, just a bit of my background with uh, JV Inkai. I've been working with the operation for about two and a half years in a corporate technical support role. In this role, I was a member of the location. Uh, Sergey had shown just generally where the site was, but just in a bit more detail. So the Inkai mine site is located remotely in the Suzak district. If I can get this. Uh, yeah, right in, right in here. Uh, it's located in the Suzak district of South Kazakhstan Oblast, near the town of Taikonur. Uh, as I just noted, you can see it on the map in blue. The major centers near the mine site are Kislord and Shimkent. Uh, the mine is approximately 350 kilometers northwest of the city of Shimkent, which is shown uh, down here as a red dot on the map. And then approximately 155 kilometers uh, east of the city of Kislorda, which is shown as the green dot on the map over here. Uh, those are the two uh, major centers uh, with airports and support, etc. By road, the site's approximately 470 kilometers from Shimkent and 290 kilometers from Kislorda. So, so the point is, it's uh, in quite a remote location. The corporate office for the joint venture is located in Shimkent, which is where many of the Kazakh uh, Uranium Joint Venture Offices are located. So the parcel of land set out in the mining allotment for JV Inkai covers 139 kilometers squared. For comparison purposes, I've shown the Toronto Airport uh, on the left. Uh, I, I'm uh, following a lot of the similar standards that a lot of the other presenters use, but basically, this airport covers about 19 square kilometers. It's shown to scale there, just to give you a bit of a sense on how large the site actually is. There are three processing facilities on the site. There's the main processing plant, which is located at Block 1. Whoops. How'd I go back here? There we go. Ah, here we are. So there's the main process plant, which is in the south area of the deposit. Uh, that plant takes pregnant leaf solution all the way through to final peroxide product. There's the satellite one plant, which is located at block two. Uh, it processes uh, pregnant leaf solution through to eluate. And then there's a second satellite at block three, which has a similar process to block two in that it processes pregnant solution through to eluate. The main facilities for the site are mostly located at block one, but there are some facilities at the other two blocks. So when I say facilities, they mean the offices, the shops, uh, there's a canteen at block one, etc. At Taikonur, JV Inkai has an employee residence camp with catering and leisure facilities for approximately 300 employees, which you can see in the very south uh, area down here. So the Inca deposit was discovered during drilling campaigns conducted in 1976 through 1978 by the Volkovskaya expedition. By that time, prospecting and exploration programs had also resulted in identification of the Uvanis, uh, Jelpak, Kanjigan, and Minkoduk deposits. Together with the Inca deposit, they formed a large new uranium mineralization project in the Shu Sarsu depression. A pilot test using the in-situ recovery mining method was performed in the northeast area of Block 1 starting in December 1988. In September 2005, J.D. Inkai decided to construct the main processing plant. In 2009, plant construction was complete and the processing of solutions commenced. 
Also in 2009, JVA and Kai constructed and began commissioning of Satellite 1 to process solution recovery from Block 2. In 2011, JV Inkai received regulatory approval for processing at Satellite 1. <coughs> Exploration work on Block 3 identified extensive mineralization hosted by several horizons. This deposit required further assessment to determine its commercial viability. This appraisal complies the exploration and delineation program carried out from 2006 to 2016, including field and situ recovery tests. November 26 or 2017, uh, Amendment Number Six to the Resource Use Contract was signed, providing rights for mining in the overall mining allotment area, which now included Block Three. So enough about the history. Uh, now we'll get into a bit of uh, the ink or the activities at the site. Since the mine started production in 2010, the JV Inkai team has undertaken a number of continuous improvement initiatives. It can be broken into categories as follows. Uh, planning initiatives, operational improvements, and quality improvements. The next two slides will touch briefly on each of these areas. Initially, we'll touch on some of the key planning improvements. In the initial years of mine life, 2D sections were used to interpret the ore body and determine both well locations and screen placement. Over the last few years, the operation has moved to 3D geological modeling. This has improved both well and screen placement, leading to the following. There is a decrease in the rock mass leach because it is easier to visualize the impact area of each well and or pattern of wells and focus the acid on the ore body rather than uh, barren rock. Since better ground is under leach, the head grades have improved. Uh, finally, by limiting leach solutions to productive ground, the acid consumption has also been reduced. And for, uh, I assume uh, most of the people in the room are, uh, are quite familiar with uh, acid consumption and its relation to uh, ISL mining. It is the single biggest cost, so anything you can do to reduce acid is, uh, is a uh, benefit right to your bottom line. So the Inkai deposit, as uh, Sergey had mentioned and as, as the other presenters have mentioned, is comprised of multiple stack layers. As the operation matured, the team moved from single wells to uh, single well leaching to mul or shall I say take that again. As the operation matured, the team moved from single well leaching multiple zones to single well single zone configurations where practical. This has resulted in significantly better flow diffusion and higher recovery timelines. This improvement provides very similar benefits to those achieved by 3D modeling. The mine uses a flexible Excel-based planning tool that allows planning, tracking against the plan, and drives continuous improvement in the mine planning process. This is achieved by comparing plan data to actual data and continually improving the database with this information. This tool allows mine staff to compare different scenarios quickly and efficiently during the planning process to address the goals of the joint venture and effectively understand and manage technical risks in mining your body. The graph on this uh, slide is an example of the output from the mine scheduling tool. The various well fields are plotted in various colors and plotted on the stack graph with the scenario total monthly production total shown on the left. Inkai has also embraced the concept of the digital mine. I just touched on the integrated planning system. In addition, the site is generating automated reports in some areas uh, working together with Cameco on digital processing models of the process plant and Cas Adamprom on broader digitization initiatives across the uranium mining sector in general. The Inkai site has also improved maintenance performance over the life of the facility. This has been achieved through reviewing and adopting best practices, training staff in specific areas, Outsourcing is appropriate and digitizing where it makes sense. In the initial years of operation, wells under acidification, wells under active leaching were managed to a similar pH. As the team learned about the deposit, the team recognized an opportunity to aggressively acidify wells, followed by a slightly less aggressive pH re regime during active leaching. This has provided 
another reduction in the total mass of acid required to leach a given area. In any given well field, different well fields may require different acid concentrations to achieve the leaching profile required. A double collector system is in place at Inkai to allow two different acid concentrations to be provided to a given or well field. This has decreased acid use by up to 15% in some areas. The U-tube elution columns in satellite one have a very big positive impact on both reagent consumption and aliquid loading. These U-tubes have been shown to increase aliquid concentrations by a significant factor compared to the traditional batch elution columns in the main processing plant. In the early years of production, loaded resin was moved from satellite one to the main processing plant for elution and processing. This was before the U-tubes at satellite one were installed in commission. Given the performance of the U-tubes versus the traditional elution columns installed at the main processing plant, this process has now been reversed in that resin from the main processing plant is moved from sat or moved to satellite one for the elution step, and then elution or eluit is trucked back to the main processing plant for further processing to final product. Today the site uses U-tubes as much as possible to take advantage of the of the of the, in, the inherent efficiency of these U-tubes. The continuous improvement culture continues to live strong today in Inkai. Recently, the team identified an opportunity to change from metallic to plastic piping for well-filled acid delivery lines. Increasing acid dilution and increasing flow rates will allow the same acid to be delivered to each well field with plastic versus metallic piping. The change has the potential to provide significant capital savings each year due to the large geographic area of the mine site that more than offset the additional operating costs associated with pumping extra liquid. In Kazakhstan, engineering projects require approval from a body of state engineering experts. This project is under review by the state body and if approvals come through as expected, uh, implementation should start this year. As discussed throughout the presentation, the JV Inkai team has a strong culture of continuous improvement. The team has traditionally and continues to look for new ways to mine more efficiently and effectively. Many of these reductions have been achieved through an innovative culture within the joint venture team. I should also note that the team monitors and implements industry best practices where they fit the culture and environment at the mine. Recently, the team started using the 5S and uh, Lean systems within the JV. It is still early days, but so far the results are quite promising. The JV Inkai mine is a world-class facility. This is achieved not by resting on past performance, but by continually looking for ways to get better. This creates a positive, challenging environment for staff and a sustainable operation for the shareholders. Thank you for your attention, and from there I'll turn it over to questions. So that move from metallic piping to uh, PVC piping or plastic piping, what will that do in terms of the increased delta in your production? I think that, what will that do in terms of increased poundage production? Uh, it doesn't impact the production at all. All it, all it actually impacts is the uh, concentration of the acid in the, in the line being delivered to the well field. So wouldn't the increase of acid in the line that's being delivered uh, precipitate more or, or allow the removal of more uranium? It's the same number of uh, grams that are being uh, delivered to the well field. It's simply that it's being uh, delivered at a lower concentration. And that brings the cost down? Yes. By how much? I don't want to get into the details of the costs. Thank you. I have a question about the digital mines. Yes. When we're talking, uh, many rumors about that. So what's your opinion about the digital mine? Do you want what do you mean by that? It's only remote control for some operating parameters or something more? I, I think the digital mine uh, includes a lot of different parameters. So, so I would suggest uh, um, it, 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 it can mean as much or as little as, as, uh, as, as a particular facility uh, wants to treat it. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. So if I, if I look at what Inca is doing today, 
Uh, INCI has an integrated planning system. Uh, uh, they've done uh, significant work on uh, creating uh, SISCAD models for all of the processing plants to better predict performance uh, and, and, and also uh, optimize uh, reagent use, et cetera. Um, you, uh, they also uh, are, are looking at uh, remotely uh, controlling of, uh, of, of well fields. I believe you guys have that, if I'm not mistaken, do you guys have that at, at uh, Caratow, I believe? Do you, do you not? Yeah, I think I've been to the control room there. Uh, so it, it, it can mean that, uh, uh, or, or it can mean all the way to uh, controlling the, the site, this, or the entire site uh, remotely. Uh, my sense is the, is the industry has a long way to go before we can do that. But uh, I think that's probably the ultimate goal of digitization. Are there any other questions? Operational excellence, innovation, and research and development for CATCO, tools for CATCO, future successes. Yeah. So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so I will uh, present uh, what we are doing at CATCO. First of all, you can see, uh, I think we have not seen so much of the steps, so I thought that it was uh, nice uh, that we have uh, some uh, just overview of uh, what it looked like in the, in the step in Kazakhstan. Uh, so these are some uh, drilling rigs uh, in the middle of, uh, of the step. So, uh, so briefly, the content of my presentation, who we are, uh, where uh, we are located, uh, our uh, current success today and tomorrow, and uh, as uh, said by Anna, some, some tools for, for future success, operational excellence, innovation, R&D, and I will hope to have the room for a few questions. So who we are? Uh, we are uh, a joint venture uh, with uh, Orano Mining, 51% uh, majority shareholder. For those who don't know who is Orano Mining, uh, just to remind the new name of uh, Areva. Uh, and uh, the second partner is of course the national operator, uh, Kazatom Pong, with 49%. Uh, actually, uh, we were established uh, uh, 20 years ago, more or less at the same time as Inkai in 1996. Uh, <coughs> just to show where we are, uh, so I have put here, so a lot that have been said before about uh, uh, Kazakhstan, the uranium reserves, etc. So I will not comment. We are in the Shusarisu uh, basin, uh, which holds about 60% of the uh, Kazakhstani uh, resources, and it's one of the most prolific pro uranium provinces in Kazakhstan. Uh, where we are, so we are uh, north of Shinkent, north northeast of Shinkent, about uh, 400 uh, kilometers, 380 kilometers, uh, north of Shinkent. Uh, we are in the uh, South Kazakhstan region, oblast in Russian. So you can see uh, here uh, our. Sorry. So uh, this is uh, uh, our main facility in, uh, in Torpiduk. Uh, here you have uh, the administrative building. Here you have uh, the plant, <coughs> some basins, some ponds, uh, warehouses. 
uh, and the two plants here in uh, in Muyunkum, uh, which are producing uh, LU8. Uh, each of them are, have a capacity of 1,500 cubic meter per hour, and here we have uh, one uh, 3,000 uh, cubic meter per hour. And this is a small satellite in Torquedo North. Uh, so we are uh, the largest uh, employer in the South Kazakhstan region uh, with uh, a little bit less than uh, 1,200 uh, employees out of which 98.5% uh, uh, are, are local people. We have uh, more than 72 people coming from the South Kazakhstan region and uh, more than 52% coming from the Suzak region. And uh, of course we are based in Almaty so we have uh, about 100 people in, uh, in Almaty, and we have uh, uh, a little bit less than uh, 20 uh, expatriates. I'm uh, pointing that out here because we are, we are in Canada, and of course, uh, 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 relation with local communities, corporate social responsibility, uh, climate change are participated in something which is uh, very important, and uh, uh, as uh, Oran Mining, as a sustainable mining company, it's a, a very important point on which we have to put uh, a lot of uh, attention. So, as I mentioned, uh, we have been created more than uh, 20 years ago, in 1996, at the same time as our colleague from Inkai. And uh, in a very short uh, period of time, we have become uh, one of the largest uh, uranium producers in the world. Since uh, 2006, we started industrial operation. We ramped up to the plateau of 4,000 tons of uranium per year, which made CATCO the largest uh, ISR uh, uranium mine in the world. And since that time, we've produced more than 35,000 tons of uranium. Sorry, I'm from Europe, so I'm not counting in the pound. So. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the three main drivers for, for this uh, industrial success is, of course, uh, nature with a very rich uranium deposit in Kazakhstan, the ISR uh, robust and efficient technology, which has been largely presented by my predecessors, and the long term partnership between the French and the Kazakhstani partners, and I'd say relying on both expertise from both sides. Uh, we are continuing uh, in uh, April uh, 2017, exactly on the 10th of April last year. Uh, our shareholders, Orano and Kazatom Prom, signed a strategic agreement. And uh, we received the early January this year uh, the mining license for a new uh, promising uh, deposits with new reserves with more than 10 years of uh, production. And uh, our operation uh, will continue in the coming decades. So how are we looking uh, to this uh, future? Uh, so operational excellence, day-to-day -day innovation, and research and, and development are key drivers. First of all, and I should have started uh, like that, of course, safety is absolutely critical. It's our first priority. Our final objective is zero accident. So you can see from this curve that uh, we came from a, a long way, over about uh, 10 years. So uh, last year, our frequency rate was uh, 0 0.21. Just to add that uh, our way of counting, we are counting here not only CATCO result, but also our contractors. This is as per uh, oral no mining uh, approach. And you have seen as well here how we are counting. I don't know how uh, my colleague from Uranium One is counting here. It's really the French approach. It's a number of lost time accident multiplied by 10 million uh, divided by the number of uh, work hours. So it means that uh, with uh, 0.2, it corresponds to uh, uh, roughly one accident during the year. Uh, operational excellence. So uh, it's something which is, in fact, is coming for all who knows. Uh, obviously, it's coming from the automotive industry, from, uh, uh, from Toyota, actually, from many, many years ago. So uh, we are uh, working with improving uh, our managers. What are the mission of the manager? It's to be exemplar, to uh, cooperate, to work on problem solving, to be transparent, to develop teamwork. So we have carried out last year uh, top, top 10 management, uh, uh, have uh, 10 top 10 top management have uh, passed the manager in the field training. 
We have uh, 24 problem solving ongoing, 15 out of which have already been completed. We have uh, trained uh, almost half of the staff, 500 people, and over 800 people were trained uh, to, the, to the tools and methods. Uh, visual management is something that has been implemented uh, largely and uh, is uh, really very, very helpful with more than 100 employees trained with this tool and uh, uh, 21 projects are currently uh, being used even at my level as, as manager I have uh, the uh, visual management of all our of my operations. So you have here some few few examples how it was. Uh, here you have uh, uh, the, 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 the warehouse. Uh, the, the warehouse uh, here. So uh, one of the key uh, tools is of course uh, uh, the master plan, so which is uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, way to innovate. Uh, so you have to identify a number of uh, projects, uh, but of course not a, a portfolio that you will be not able to manage. So uh, you have to focus on short term, uh, short term meaning less than six months, up to one year, but not more. And you need to choose, of course, those projects will have a clear positive impact on, on the company strategy. So if you have here a look at what we achieved, uh, you see that we had about 70 projects. Uh, we finished 45 of them. Some were uh, delayed by one month, which is acceptable. Some were delayed a little bit more, and we, we canceled five. So you see that even with a portfolio of 70 projects, you cannot achieve everything. And even for 2018, uh, we have dramatically reduced even the number of projects, considering that uh, in order to focus on operation and be able to finish the project, we have to divide the number of projects by about two, uh, two. So we are today in, a, in the range of 35 to 40 projects only. Developed uh, uh, and worked a lot about uh, reactive transport simulation from uh, commercial tools uh, like Francine, which is a very classical tool uh, used in the uh, oil and gas industry, to develop the fluid flow, uh, simulate uh, the fluid transport, and to be able to, to make simulation uh, modeling of a block within a couple of days only. Uh, time of calculation is extremely quick, so you can see it's about 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, you can measure uh, KPI as KPIs, the performance of the injection, the performance of the producers, and you can visualize the invasion of the reservoir. On a more, uh, really more um, technical, uh, let's say physical uh, parameters, we have developed uh, with uh, Orano Mining and uh, some uh, collaboration with the French universities, we have developed a uh, uh, reactive 3D transport simulation tool, which is called HiTech, which couple hydraulic and chemistry, which allow to visualize uh, the dissolved uranium, uh, optimize the U recovery curve, optimize the planning, and study natural attenuation. So I hope that it will work. Okay. So you can see here, uh, it's about uh, over uh, 500 days. So you see the evolution of uh, one parameter in the uh, in 3D. So I guess it will stop. So, uh, <coughs> digital mine, one topic where I heard one question. Actually, uh, we are very practical and, and concrete. Uh, I am not a great fan of buzzword, so for me, it should be a practical uh, topic uh, with the return on investment which allow me uh, to demonstrate the, the justification of the, of the CAPEX. So we are focusing on, a, one, as a, one example is a reliable database, so we are changing the tool this year. 
which will allow us to have really uh, a good data input, uh, robustness of the database, to have the interop interoperability, being able to optimize the well field, uh, to do some uh, visual management, to do some uh, 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 to have some uh, shared uh, data uh, through, through web, to be able to do some reporting, but uh, and to save some time of uh, manual operation which are leading to some mistakes and to work on uh, planification. So we are rolling out that uh, with our uh, with a commercial tool that we have uh, purchased. Uh, research and development, uh, we have few ideas. Uh, even uh, the technology uh, in Kazakhstan are very robust. Uh, I have a 20 years uh, oil and gas background, so I'm very surprised by the fact that the tools we are using are let's say, at least old-fashioned. So, uh, for example, uh, in terms of logging, we are using very, very old tools. Uh, and of course, new tools which are coming and available in, uh, in logging, for example, needs to demonstrate their effectiveness and uh, what they, they are bringing. But uh, what we are looking for when we are drilling, uh, because we are drilling a lot of wells, uh, is to get a, a petrophysical parameter, porosity and permeability. And for that, the uh, oil and gas industry has all the tools for decades, and we are using very old-fashioned tools, resistivity, uh, we are not using sonic, we, are not, we have more or less nothing. So we, are, we have a project to use a nuclear magnetic resonance uh, to determine uh, permeability in the boreholes, to be able to measure porosity. Uh, we will demonstrate the technology exists. The only thing that we will try to demonstrate that it is really cost effective and that it will bring added value for our operation. Again, so it's a transfer from one domain to another. The question is really whether with the current low price of the uranium, can we afford that? But in terms of data, you have seen from my presentation and presentation of my colleagues, we have nice modeling tools, but everybody knows garbage in, garbage out. If we have no proper data, our modeling will just give us bullshit. <laughs> uh, another tool, I am in Canada, very famous for the oil sand, of course, also coming from the oil and gas industry. This uh, ISR technology is really, we are drilling 700 to 1,000 wells per year at the depths between uh, 300 to uh, 700 meter. In our mine, we are between 300 and 500 meter. And I'm very surprised that uh, uh, we have not even thought about drilling horizontal wells in order to uh, uh, address it in a more effective way. Uh, of course, uh, we need to identify uh, good uh, suppliers, good drilling companies. So if there are any people interested in the room, I will be very happy to talk with them. I've already seen some uh, suppliers in the conference. I think it could be a very, it could be a change maker in the future. Uh, completely changing the approach of doing ISR. And again, <coughs> reducing completely uh, our drilling costs, which represent a huge impact on the, on the capex. So, uh, just uh, to conclude, uh, so we are relying on, on various uh, tools and you can see very day-to-day -day operational tools, uh, of course, uh, using operational excellence, using innovation, and uh, not forgetting uh, research and development that could uh, bring us a new uh, uh, cost-cutting and so being uh, really successful for the future. Thank you very much. Uh, 
hand tools that we can, we can measure directly. Um, again, uh, it is not, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not the expert in, uh, in, uh, in uranium, but we have observed a disequilibrium. So that's uh, one of the major constraints uh, which exists uh, with the current Kazakhstani standard. And clearly, uh, we have sometimes some disagreement with our uh, Kazakhstani colleague on, on this matter. So I fully agree with you. It's really a, a, a major difficulty. Uh, and uh, even, uh, I would say even the classical rolf front model, we have even some uh, proof that it is not 100% perfect. So we have some discussion with Volkov Geologic. They cannot admit that we can have uh, mineralization behind the whole front, but it exists. And in some places, uh, as you say, we have the gamma ray data, but it is, there is no uranium. Actually, it's already an issue. Uh, the we can discuss it a lot about the uh, equilibrium factor. And the question is, we have the TFN logging for that, but it's very expensive. And the solution may be how to uh, create more advanced technology for uh, TFN logging. That would be issue. But my question is related to the simulation. How do you, you uh, really use this? I mean, process simulation, which I also talked about. How do you use it in, for mine planning and for maybe drill spacing estimation, effective drill spacing? So the tool uh, uh, will be rolled out this year in operation. Uh, as my, my experience uh, from, uh, you have, there are two types of modeling. Uh, the uh, front scene is a very quick and dirty uh, modeling. Uh, it's very nice. It helps you, I would say, to do a very, uh, very quick uh, uh, assessment. Uh, the uh, high-tech uh, model, is like uh, uh, Eclipse for the oil and gas. It's a very complex tool, uh, which is really, uh, you cannot do that on a daily basis. Uh, so we, we have now created what we can call reservoir engineering team, uh, which will be, for me, will be the future of ISR. Will be, you will have to have different, you will have to have reservoir engineering people being able to do the modeling with different uh, out, outcome which might be reserve estimation, placing wells, uh, planning. Uh, for the moment, uh, what I see, uh, we are mostly using it at, at block level uh, in order to, to, to better assess uh, how we will do the, the drilling. The difficulty, uh, especially uh, we have a, a very, very large ore body and we are spread uh, over a very, very large surface. What I am missing, personally, is uh, to have a full 3D model of all the entire uh, ore body. Because uh, uh, even at the block uh, level, even if you take a couple of blocks, uh, you, are, you have to have boundaries, boundaries to your model. And this is uh, the most critical issue. So in fact, you need to go up to uh, the edge of your, uh, your model. And uh, then uh, we enter into a, a computational computing time, uh, so we need to have a, a supercomputer or something like that. So it's, you are not doing that on a daily basis. Huh? Oh, that's a, a very good question. Uh, as you have seen, uh, the, these deposits are known, I would say, since the early 60s. Uh, personally, I'm a sedimentary geologist. I've worked uh, in, uh, in oil and gas in exploration. I'm frustrated as a geologist that we don't have a good, ge uh, a good update of the geology. We know, we know the stratigraphy, more or less. We know that there's sandstone and, uh, and clays. Uh, I have asked the question in the previous session. Uh, we see the, the shape of the rural front. So uh, one answer, answer was the lithology and the uh, hydrology. In terms of sedimentology, I have no idea because there are no good cores. There is no good uh, sedimentary, um, sedimentological model. We are in between, uh, I would say, and continental to fluvio deltaic, sometimes marine influence. I have not seen so far a good up-to-date 2018 uh, model with uh, up-to-date uh, uh, sedimentary stratigraphy, 
sequence stratigraphy and modeling, which give, could give us in the future, I would say, better tools in order to uh, do a good modeling. Because 3D modeling without a good uh, sedimentological model will, is hopeless. The fact is, and here I, I agree with my colleagues, the cost of production is today so low that doing this investment, uh, my CFO and my shareholder will say, why invest? Because uh, we are so low in terms of cost of production, it's pointless to do that. But in terms of models, we don't know where we are so far. And I hope you will tend to agree with me on that. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your attention. Very informative.